thing. Uh, another thing is that I know I owe you a, I got a book that's coming out in, uh, in about three weeks called Seattle 100. That's a little sticky that says office copy. Um, and I've been kind of given the behind the scenes play by play in the uh, eight weeks up to launch here. So I know I owe you guys one of those before the end of the week. Um, and then I've got a little set of notes here. Let me take a peek. Uh, and then lastly, uh, for my opening salvo here is I'm headed to China on Friday to do a really killer uh, assignment that I can't wait to tell you a little bit more about. But the intro is here. I'm flying to China to Shanghai and sailing um, with renowned explorer Mike Horn on his 110 foot sailboat, the Pangea, um, from Shanghai to Taipei. And reportedly there's a full media center on the boat and I'll be broadcasting. I don't know if I can broadcast live yet due to internet speeds, but I'm going to be reporting um, daily if I can via Facebook, blog, and Twitter about shooting for the very fancy watch company called Panerai, which I've got one of those on right now. Um, beautiful watches, and it's going to be a, a hell of an adventure. So if you're interested in pictures and photo and video and all that kind of stuff, um, or adventure, uh, tune in with me and Mike Horn from the South China Sea. It's reportedly infested with, with pirates. 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 <laughs> Yar. They'll never find us, though, because we're sailing in a big boat that says Mercedes on the side of it. And they wouldn't be looking for that. Who would rob that? They'll never, never <laughs> figure it out. OK, um, that's the state of the art. And let's, um, D'Artagnan is joining us now. Hello, you, you, you know all these guys. And I, I want to I preface this broadcast with we're actually, these are the people that are normally on the other sides of the camera. So we're um, broadcasting this with our good friend Alex, who's on the camera right there. What's up, Alex? <laughs> um, and no one's really monitoring anything, so you have yeah, to. Uh, yeah, credit is that true? Well, Mikal's back there running the show. <laughs> Mikal, the producer, is back there with the headphones on, just running the show. Um, so, anyway, if we may have some technical uh, difficulties, or we may just glide through under Mikal's guide <laughs> um, and nail it. So, the topic of today, if I'm not mistaken, um, is workflow. Um, you may have watched either the post from yesterday or the original workflow video. Um, we made that video because uh, we got, it was probably the most requested thing. How do you guys treat your data? How do you guys, you know, what software do you guys use? What do you store it on? Um, and we got those questions bombarding us for years and we thought it, it, it would be good if we did a uh, video on how we actually run that. So. We did that, and I think it's been seen about 200,000 times on YouTube alone now, um, and it's been and been pretty popular. And there's a huge pile. Hello, Kate. <laughs> there's a huge pile of questions that have poured in, and we couldn't really keep up with it on the blog. Um, so we thought we'd do a Chase Jarvis live and talk about it. And my esteemed colleagues here, D'Artagnan, <laughs> Scott, and Eric, are uh, a part of this broadcast because they are the ones who actually like kick, 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 sh move the data around <laughs> and, and crunch on the files and stuff. So they're actually um, every bit perhaps more knowledgeable uh, on this than I am. We've got some of the things that we use piled up over here. We'll bring those on set when we can. And the goal is to answer a bunch of questions that we've already received and take live questions from Twitter at hashtag, which is the little number sign, CJ Live. Long, boring intro. Welcome on the show, D'Artagnan. Thank you. Scott. Eric. Hey. Um, I have several questions. Is there anything that you guys, that I'm going to start asking you guys, that have come in already from my blog post yesterday via email? Is there anything that you guys, any opening remarks that you would like to make to the internet? Uh, no, I'm pretty free of opening remarks. Uh, I just hope that you guys come with some good questions uh, over at the hashtag there and uh, give us a chance to help you out and answer you. Take that. There it is. I'm on the same page as D'Artagnan. Eric? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Internet, um, you can see why we spend most of the time <laughs> behind the cameras. <laughs> we're not good at this. Full of no, we're also get, we're going to try a, a, a new format too. We are going to stop at eleven o'clock <clears throat> Pacific time sharp, which is in eighty four minutes by my clock here on my uh, my computer. Um, these things can go all day, and 
for one, we, we're trying to be a little bit disciplined. For two, I need to be somewhere at 11.30. <laughs> so um, let's see. The first question is, well, there, again, there's a million. These are just some of the ones that are on my laptop there that have come in um, by my note here, 141 questions. Um, first of all, why Aperture? So I'll, I'll answer mine and then kick it over to these guys. It's basically video. Um, video, I mean, there, there's a, a million reasons and, and no software is bad. It's kind of like Mercedes or BMW, whether you're using Aperture or Lightroom. Um, and for us, the fact that Aperture reads video and we're often having a lot of mixed media on location, that's uh, become a default to us. Plus, we really like how it integrates with the rest of the ecosystem. So um, you want to touch on that, guys? I mean, uh, Lightroom 3 brought video along with it, too, now. Um, Aperture was out before it, so it sort of became our de facto. And when we started moving those databases around on the internets and, and across our own servers and stuff, it, we just got comfortable with it and uh, haven't really moved too far into the Lightroom world uh, or anybody else's software, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, back. so the, the general rule, as far as I'm concerned, is um, do what you're comfortable with and, and what gives you the best results. And the best results often have a whole lot to do with your practice. Uh, and so, yeah, we've been using it for, what, four years, something, four or five years now? Yeah. Um, and so, and we all know it front to back and can get, you know, great results for, throughout the entire process. Um, D'Artagnan will go in and hack web galleries out of there and, Tweak all the code. I'll, you know, I've got the raw processing super super dialed. I do like the raw processing engine. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so uh, as a team, I think we're just very very comfortable using it and uh, consistently happy with the results. So all's well. Yeah. What, what do you want? You actually, you you really do a lot of the video stuff. Yeah, and, and scrub. I'm, I'm the video guy around here, and so I don't I don't use Aperture a lot. Most of Everything I do is in Final Cut Pro, but what's great about Aperture is that it's a nice, familiar uh, workflow for Chase to work with so he can go through and familiarize himself with the video too, rather than trying to make multiple Final Cut Pro projects or having him dabble in what I'm doing. You can go through and scrub through the audio. You can even do it when we're offloading in the field so you can have your own you know, high level of familiarity with what I'm working with. Yeah, I, I like being able to review, I mean, we call them dailies, but in, in many ways, with, when D'Artagnan's crunching the files right there, they're kind of hourlies. Um, we want to make sure before we leave. You know, sometimes the pro productions are, are slow and luxurious, slow and luxurious, and you get the opportunity to um, to like shoot and then take a day and review all the things. Then if you missed anything, go back. And and, and a, lot, a lot of times they're a lot of they're quick and fast paced and furious. In which case. Um, it's more of a run and gun style, especially with uh, a lot of the HD DSLR technology. Um, and we need to move quickly, and quickly involves making sure we have the shot and looking at it on a big monitor in the truck um, before, before we move on. So we like, like to be able to scrub through there. Um, I'm going to kick us on to another question here from Jay Wilker, which has a lot to do with storage on hard drives. So hopefully you've seen the workflow video. If not, just Google Chase Jarvis workflow, um, and you'll see that we do, we use a lot of a lot of different hard drives. There's two primary um, two primary things we focus on. One is, um, is is backing up and get the data on as many copies as possible of uh, on many hard drives as possible. Um, one that is your working copy and a backup copy, and then also an offsite copy in case anything happens at the local location. Um, and then the other one is that we emphasize the scalability. What we do in that video is obviously at a professional level, we've been doing this our whole lives. That's the only jobs that any of us have ever had. Um, but that the same concepts apply, but maybe to a lower or a lesser degree for someone at home who's maybe not a professional, maybe just aspiring or, or otherwise. The question from Jay Wilker is about, okay, so you've got that data stored on off-site hard drives. Mm -hmm. How do you keep those things refreshed? How do you keep them? Because in theory, data can degrade on there. 
Um, Absolutely. Yeah, um, and, and we've, we're an advocate of not using DVDs, but, um, but definitely, uh, what, you want to address that, D'Artagnan, like yeah, what we do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have everything on uh, external RAID drives. Um, they're the G-Speed uh, ES, the big giant things with four hard drives in them. Um, and so once a year, give or take, um, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, we go to our top secret backup location uh, with our laptops and fire all those things up and just sort of spin through them and compare them to the list that we know is on our internal servers here. Um, not for a standpoint of really looking for missing bits and bytes, more as uh, it's been told to me and I think other people by uh, some really smart hard drivey guys that the simple act of spinning up a hard drive and looking through each folder is really going to help it in its retention and its, its, uh, its use over a period of time. Optical media, although it's getting better, it still is not really a, a good long-term storage solution. Uh, I've spun up many of CDs and DVD backups even here in the studio where something that we burned four years ago is basically a coaster now. Drop it into your computer and it, there's just <laughs> nothing on it. It's completely unreadable, which is uh, uh, frightening uh, <laughs> if you're I love the data coaster. management guy. Yeah, I love you a, good a pile of coasters around here. Um, so we try to get into our top secret location and spin those hard drives up, uh, especially the ones that sit for long periods of time. Uh, the current G speed that we're working with uh, is coming in and out of the studio all the time. So that thing's always spinning up and spinning down and, and getting more data added to it. But once we hit that eight terabyte uh, storage capacity, then we file those things away. Um, and so once a year we go and spin them up again. Although one thing worth noting on that, and, and it's sort of a side effect to technology just advancing, um, but when we started storing data in offsite drives, you know, maybe the highest capacity drive was 250 gigs or something like that. Um, and so we got a pile of those drives, and as they, as they were starting to get old and rusty, it made really good sense to consolidate all that onto a you know, two terabyte rated drive, and then we started stacking those up, and, and then technology got better, and we were able to reconsolidate. So um, the process of keeping, um, just keeping the hard drives up to date also gives you the chance to um, both check your data and also to get it onto some more modern uh, storage method, which started all the way back with DVDs, and is is uh, we still have everything we had on DVDs back in 1982, <laughs> not 82, uh, onto now our big, you know, rated terabyte, many terabyte uh, off-site storage. So, all good. Yeah, um, well, there's a bazillion questions pouring in here, but I like that. Like, there's yeah, <laughs> sorry, we've got a, well, a number of devices. Questions. Yeah. Um, and my take is, um, yeah, that we we go to great lengths to protect protect our data for our own, I mean, intellectual property and and digital files is what we create for a living. It's what um, what drives our our business. Um, and there's just it's just too serious to mess around. So we are constantly checking and double checking the files that we've got against our main drive and our backup drive on our own location. When we dump everything onto the server here, we check the right number of files, the right number of bits and bytes that have been copied from those drives onto the server. And then when we copy it from the server to our, our backup, um, our offsite drives, we're also doing the same thing. We're counting the number of files, and we're counting the number of bits and bytes and comparing that those files have truly transferred. We're opening the files from that other hard drive to make sure that we're not losing anything along the way. Um, and I think that underscores kind of like just general good data management principles. And the equivalent for someone who might not be in the pro photo video space is when you copy your music from one drive to another, is there the right number of songs? Is there the right number of files over there? And once you've done that, you're you're good. Um, there's a number of <laughs> questions. If you guys want to jump in on one, um, please do. Yeah, I just got a, a, a text or not a text a uh, Twitter here from V Bonds um, that wants to know about online cloud storage. Um, we go back and forth at looking at this technology um, as opposed to running everything to our offsite stuff. Um, it, we constantly go, hey, it would be neat if we just press a button and walk away and it goes up there to the internet. Um, the problem that we have and I'm, uh, is that the amount of data we have to transfer 
A, to go over the cloud could take a week per photo shoot, and we would end up being several weeks behind at the end of the year. Um, they do allow for sending in hard drives, uh, most of those services, um, but then we're already writing it to hard drives, so there doesn't seem any reason to send it. Uh, I do use some cloud storage personally at home for my own stuff. Uh, I like the way it works. It's sort of brainless. It just backs up my stuff, and it's nice. Um, there's just not a cloud storage system that is cost-effective as a off-site hard drive is when you compare the storage, the storage rate, and then the amount of transfer and the transfer time that it takes to go through for us. Word. Word. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, we can come back with, what was, what was remember the last shoot? I mean, sometimes if we're shooting one or two red cameras and uh, like the Nikon D3X, which is creating 25 megapixel, what, what are those file sizes? They're, they're, they're substantial, but you know, you go away and you shoot, you do that for a week on location, you come home, where it's like terabyte of data, eh? Mm -hmm. Or more. Yeah, yeah, it gets there. And um, and <coughs> you start piping that, you know, pointing that data cannon at the cloud, and you start like <laughs> looking at your fancy Panerai watch, going, it's going to be like a week before this gets there. And if you head off and do it again, mm -hmm. the next week, you, you start to see the pattern here. You could be in a problem. I'm I'm very optimistic that as internet speeds and the pipes get bigger, um, that it's gonna actually work for professionals. It's not quite there yet, or it might be, might be suitable for a, a smaller professional outfit, um, but we're not, we're not there yet. Um, Kate, the superstar producer, just slipped me this note. It says, can they watch on iPad? Apparently, there's a lot of questions coming in, and the answer is yes, you can. Yes, uh, it is. Ustream, right? Ustream.tv slash channel slash Chase Jarvis. Uh, basically, if you go through the Ustream angle as opposed to the Chase Jarvis Live angle, they have a uh, iPad, iPhone, uh, MP4 live streaming thing happening on their end. So, yeah. Ustream.tv slash live slash, or I'm sorry, slash channel slash Chase Jarvis. Ustream.tv <laughs> slash channel Right slash on the Chase screen, Jarvis. Alex. Yeah. We just <laughs> <laughs> this is where. Nicole, we, can you put that <laughs> title up on the <laughs> <This> is, <laughs> where If we all weren't here, we would have a lovely URL appear up on the, um, uh, on the screen. Um, so check it out there iPad, iPhone. Uh, Scotty, take a question from yeah, the world. Yeah, I just got I just got a shout from uh, my friend Jonathan Co up in Alberta, Canada. He and I what? hooked up and did some mountain biking in Rossland, BC. Represent. Um, and he asks, have you guys considered SSD drives or is it still cost prohibitive? And our location drives that uh, are tied directly into the laptop and that we're dropping the data from the camera on are... Sometimes dropping. <laughs> our SSD drives, um, they're not inexpensive by any stretch. They're the, uh, the <laughs> I think no. the easiest way to spend $1,000 on 256 gigs or whatever. No, it's not that bad, but they're, they're certainly the most expensive option. Um, but we also, but we, we, we back them. lightning fast. Mm -hmm. They're extremely reliable. Yeah, we, we do, I mean, we look at all these things as computer, cameras, the hard drives, um, as, as tools. And what you think of a, a contractor building a house, you know, his hammer is a tool. And... I mean, granted, a hammer and a hard drive should be treated differently, but we actually think of them in the same capacity, and, and so they need to be durable and reliable and all these things, and um, that's in many ways how we choose the manufacturers that we work with. Um, it's no surprise that manufacturers support um, photographers like us and other photographers out in the field to use their products, um, but again, I feel like we can make a choice on the range of manufacturers that we work with, and we have in many cases tested all kinds of stuff. So we make recommendations while I may be supported by the, the manufacturer, in this case, like our hard drives are GTEC. And what up, GTEC? Big love for GTEC. Um, and yeah, it's no secret they support us, but we've gone through and we've broken a, broken a lot of other stuff and, and arrived at, at GTEC or a lot of other manufacturers based on how they perform as tools in the field. Um, and the, the SSD, which if you guys don't know what that means, it's solid state drive, which means there's no disk spinning in there. It's flash memory in the same way that you have like a flash memory, like a CF card. Um, those, they respond a lot better to 
all of the hard <laughs> knocks that we give them by taking them to location. Um, and they're faster. I have uh, SSD in all of my laptops because I'm brutal on laptops. I drop them. I you know, run late catching a lot of flights. They travel all over the world, and they're just a hell of a lot more durable. Um, so again, we use the GTEC. You want to actually want to uh, yeah. grab some of those drives there? Another big prop for the SSD, uh, and part of the reason that they're in our case, uh, is that they draw less power, uh, which makes a huge difference to Scott or I when we're uh, on the side of a snowy mountain too. with nowhere near enough battery juice uh, to keep Chase's <laughs> hard drives running fast enough. Um, so having that SS the, the SSD is drawing less power means that we can download more stuff before the, the whole system crashes down upon us. Yeah, and you know, power drawing and ha have it be bus powered and whatnot is, is killer. Um, yeah, Eric's got, this is our well-known location laptop case that has seen lots of different iterations. There's a video about how we built it if you're interested. Um, those are the two SSDs. This is main and then a backup. We usually have them labeled, but these might be new ones. Um, you can see there, these are like scarred and, and maimed and beat up, mostly because they've seen a lot of action. Um, but we've got them daisy chained together there. They're light, fast, super portable. Um, and again, we, we uh, back the GTEC brand. Um, yeah, so that's them. There's also a couple of the other ones here. Uh, let's go back to the phones. Eric, I know you've got, yeah, you've I, got a, some questions. I'm sure there. we'll get to this eventually. I don't think we'll get to it yet. But uh, Will McGregor asks, what about the best way of actually filing on the drives, dates, et cetera, shoot name? Talk naming conventions, how we keep everything organized? Yeah, yeah. Why don't we kick that over to you since you were kind of instrumental in however many years ago, like developing that system. Um, and it was through a lot of trial and error and a lot of failures and down a lot of roads that didn't turn out so well for us. Yeah. Um, why don't you talk generally the theory about how we keep our data, how we ingest. Again, a lot of this is represented in the video, which you should watch if you haven't, but talk about it here for the internet. Yeah, so uh, coming from when Chase and I first started working together shooting slides, um, the sort of, yeah, I know, slides. weird, eh? Weird. The, the standard convention was that you would sort of index things by subject matter. Um, and so people had these crazy systems of, you know, state, region, county, which activity it was, blah, 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 and all kinds of keywording and this and that. Um, and we initially transferred into the digital realm uh, with that in mind. Um, but it readily became apparent that things got really unwieldy really quickly. And you brutal. Know, brutal. And there were a lot of softwares that you could attach all kinds of keyword to try and sustain the same system, but and terrible should, results. Yeah, we tried. We tried all of them. We tried all of the like the enterprise quality stuff. We had extensive portfolio building us like custom right. things, and, and and this was years ago. But it was a lot of wasted time, a lot of brutal headaches for us to get to the one that we actually ended up with, which is which is a, a date-based convention. And it seems super, super, super simple <laughs> now in retrospect. <laughs> um, oh, I couldn't tell you some stories. Yeah, exactly. Since, since computers are so good at organizing things by date, um, it makes it really simple to uh, establish an entire uh, naming convention and file structure based on that. And, uh, and it becomes very, very logical very quickly. Um, and maybe I just draw it on the Yeah, I've got a whiteboard. whiteboard. I'm going to go, I'm going to step off set and grab a little whiteboard here and, and so bring it back. One. Yeah, I got a little one. Sweet. Portaboard. Portaboard. This will be fun. We'll do some drawing. <laughs> How about some here. quick questions while he's doing that? Yeah. Uh, back to the SSD drives. Gran Turismo asks, what software are you using to write to both SSD drives at once on location? Uh, Aperture on import will actually write to a primary and a backup location. So. Uh, over in the little import window on Aperture, you can say back up to main, or uh, download to main and back up to uh, secondary, and it will do all that stuff for you. And then also import them into the library, apply all our metadata and all of our uh, naming convention on import. So uh, we sort of gloss over that. Well, maybe we don't. We, we go through that in the video if you haven't watched it yet. But it's basically drop the card into the top of that thing, uh, tell it what card number it is. This is card number six for today and we're shooting for XYZ, um, and then it does everything else. 
puts all the naming and all the metadata in. On both the drives, right? Correct. <whistles> nice. Three. Date, all right. Naming convention. Naming convention. So I'll sort of, let's see, I guess I'll start broad, broadly here. Uh, on our server in the big raw storage area, uh, you're going to have a folder called 2010, which is this year. Inside of that, you're going to have whatever project it is that we're working on at any given point in 2010. Um, so today's project would be a CJ Live broadcast. So we're going to have today's date. What's today's date? 28. 28? Yeah. 2010-09-28. And the reason it's all backwards like that year, month, day is because this becomes a sort of a serial number. Um, and if you arrange your dates in that manner, they will always go from earliest to latest. Yeah, and keep in mind that you got it like 09 for September, not 9, because that could screw you up. It's always the same have amount of digits. Same digits. Booyah. All right. So we'll have a project called 2010-09-28 CJ Live. And that's another folder on the server. My folders are getting wide. <laughs> like my booty. Yep. <laughs> like his booty. Within that, um, we're going to have all of the different uh, either cameras or if this were a, if this were a shoot, we might have it broken down by different shots. But there's going to be some sort of system where things are grouped together. In this case, there's one camera. Um, Alex's camera. Alex usually we have it. three, but yeah, we usually have multiple cameras. Um, so hypothetically, there would be in here cam one, cam two, and then inside of each of those, you would have individual files, and the individual files have all of this information packed into the file name which makes it super easy to always drill down uh, anywhere in the server and find the exact file. So if we, wanted the, if we wanted a file out of that camera from halfway into the show, we would know that we can just search the entire server for this file name. He'll show you in just a second. Yeah. <laughs> So it would be something along the lines of 2010-09-28 underscore, so that's the date of the shoot, underscore CJ Live, which is the name of the project that the shoot is happening within. And I should, I should pause right there and say we always name every project. Right. Every, every ad campaign has a project name. Everything like this is all these are CJ Lives. Um, whether we're doing, if it's personal work, whatever, every shoot, and the producers are the ones that assign those. Um, and we use those, those are definitive, they're not changing ever because then it would mess this up. So, right. CJ Live Cam 1, which we know is Alex's camera, is going to be where we look for a file from that camera. And then this would be the 2479.mov, would just be the native file name that the camera generates. Um, and a lot of people, I think, want to change that when they're renaming their files at the initial um, ingest. Uh, but we find the cameras assigning a file number to be super helpful because then you you know you all of a sudden have what is it usually 10,000 yeah. uh, digits before it overlaps, um, and so that's just kind of another guarantee that you're never going to have duplicate file names because within this day and that camera, that number's very very unlikely to ever reset. Um, so that's the naming convention and sort of how it fits into the hierarchy of the server. And then there's a folder for 2010, 2009, 2008, on and on. All the way to 1963. To 1963. Um, yeah, cool. That's a, let's a, that's let's a race that. I like having the whiteboard around. Um, I'm going to fly us back up to 30,000 feet for a second. And again, workflow, storage, and backup is really the theme that we're talking about here. And Rather than take you through the video right now, the, the general overview is we capture something on site, 
the cards come out of the cameras, they go into, into our laptop, our MacBook Pro, they, they go from the MacBook Pro on GTEC hard drives, a main and a backup. We use Aperture to name those files and it sends it to both those hard drives. Those hard drives, as soon as we're off location, as in back at the hotel, we call it base camp, we've got a base camp room, one of those files gets put on our kind of base camp, yeah, a base camp rated hard drive. Second version of that data, usually the backup drive on those SSDs, goes to a separate room just in case like the, the base camp room gets uh, jacked. Um, then we've got data separated. Um, and someone asked, actually, uh, hmm. Just to further that, until we get back into the studio, that data stays separate. Um, so usually I'll take a drive or one of the drives out of there. Scott will take a drive. Often we're on separate flights. Um, if we're not on separate flights, we FedEx separately yeah. via a separate flight. So someone asked, that's what I was just about to dig into, um, is Joseph Hetzel, Hetzel, probably mm -hmm. from Berlin. Maybe. Um, says, do you guys fly in separate planes? And the answer is, sometimes we all fly in the same plane and we have a copy of the data, but we definitely FedEx on a separate plane, um, a hard drive, so that it sounds crazy, but if we're to go, to, <laughs> if we're going to go down on the Atlantic, the data is still going to get to the client safely. So we we prioritize our clients' data in many ways over our own lives, which is a little bit weird. But a little, yeah, it's a little and, bit and I try not to think about it like, oh, we won't mind if we all die as long as they have the pictures. I I, I look at it more of a standpoint of like, well, if the plane happens to crash and they make us get out the emergency slide and we have to leave everything behind, yes, mm -hmm. then we can't bring the hard drive, and then yeah. it bursts into flames. We're still all safe. We're all right. very strong swimmers. Yeah. yeah, and it happens all the time. It does. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many crash landings we've right. made this year alone. Um, so yeah, um, Joseph Hetzel. Yes, we do. We do maintain this protocol of having the de data separate. Now again, if you're backing up your music, probably don't want to scale up to that level like we are. Um, but it just goes to show you and our clients what we do to keep the data the data safe. So as I mentioned, we, we put the stuff on the, the in-room rated hard drive, which we'll give you a tour of in just a second. Another one gets in, put in a different room, and then when the job is done, we usually fly with that guy, and then we'll FedEx um, a different one back to the studio. When we get to the studio, we take that data here, and we put it onto our server, um, which we have a monster server, um, the GTEC. G Speed FC XL, which stands for fiber channel and extra large. Um, we have like, I think 64 some odd terabytes of, um, of power and room. True. And um, we use the Apple X serves mm -hmm. to drive that big pile of hard drives. And then we, once it's on that, that the server, we put an offsite copy onto a G Speed Yes. Yes, which is the um, eSATA, right. just faster ESATA transfer. external eight terabyte. Right, and that's an eight terabyte drive, and that lives at the secret location. My mom's house. Um, not really my mom's house. And uh, so we've got, again, data in two separate places, and it doesn't stay in one place even over a single night ever. So that's the rough workflow. Um, Want to talk about that for a second? So what's going on there? Uh, so this is a uh, this is what we use in our hotel rooms as our sort of location master drive. When we come in from a day of shooting, we'll take those uh, little SSD drives that are on our Road Warrior kit and hook it up to this guy. And this is a G Safe. Um, the reason we use these things is because that the rating between two hard drives is completely foolproof and completely mindless. Nobody has to remember to do it. Nobody has to think about what's going on. There's a controller in here that automatically writes everything to both drives. Done. Um, so this is the easiest, safest, most mindless way of making that happen. Is it called the G-Safe? Yes. <laughs> safest. It's called the G-Safe. Safe. It's a good name for it, really. It'd be awkward if it was the G-Unsafe, I guess. <laughs> the G. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's awesome, bulletproof. And then those drives can actually get pulled out and live in separate rooms uh, uh, if need be as well. So again, that's the rough 
overall workflow that we just walked through. And um, Eric, take us back to the... Someone named, the some dude named Michael Garcia wants to know if our data <laughs> has ever been jacked. Hi, Michael. Has our data ever been jacked? Um, when you say jacked, I don't know if you mean held up at gunpoint and our data taken. Um, but generally speaking, and I'm knocking on all kinds of wood, um, we have not had data, um, any major data problems. And I can say that I have had bodyguards, like that are actually data and film bodyguards. Again, you do not need a gun to back up your music. <laughs> but at, uh, at, a, at a strange level that I, have, uh, I operate at, where there may be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in productions, one of a kind um, shots that can never be replicated, um, traveling in unsafe territory in, in some, I won't even name the countries because that's like naming the axis of evil. Um, but I have had a, a, body, a bodyguard, someone who's assigned to watch over the data. As soon as the data is done, it's on the computer, it lives in, in a truck where uh, Bruno is, is guarding the data. So we haven't been jacked. Um, we haven't had any planes go down. We haven't had um, any mission critical hard drives die. Um, and we haven't, you know, we haven't had any catastrophes, knock on wood again. Uh, but I believe that's because we have been freaks about maintaining the protocols that we, and we, I mean, I have, before woken up in the middle of the night and said, oh my God, there is a hard drive at the studio that I was supposed to take home. Or I know the same for D'Artagnan. And if it's one o'clock in the morning, I just got to bed, I will get out of bed, drive down here, pick it up and drive it home. So um, yeah, and to answer your question, Michael, no, no bad news. Um, we have over the course of the 10 or 15 years we've been doing this had many, many drives fail. Many drives, dozens of drives fail. And um, every brand has a certain failure rate. Um, one of the reasons we ended up partnering with GTEC is because we've had amazing success with those. We tested them, um, we found them incredibly reliable. And I should note that they just moved to putting enterprise quality drives in all of their um, and all, all of their the speeds, I think. Uh, yeah, and all of their um, speed category and above, I believe, which is huge. Um, but they were they were awesome for us. But we have, you know, in prior years had, I mean, I have personally gone through, oh, uh, God. Be yeah, yeah, before SSDs were available in notebooks, I've personally gone through half a dozen. More laptops drives. than I care to reformat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. They, they, do, they do break. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're active, you know, especially ones in the server. That's why you spread it out over 14 or 16 drives, because those things are constantly running. Like, you know, they're always being spun up. And, and when one goes in a server, you can just and put a new one in. But that's, that's an instance of a drive failing. So, And there, there's, there's sort of one other layer of <laughs> redundancy you can build into the system that's a little bit underrated, which is just don't reformat things until you need to. Um, so your card that you shoot in your camera, when you go to download it to your hard drive, don't erase the card. Keep the card until you need to shoot it again. And if you have a collection of cards, you know, it might be a couple of weeks before you need to shoot that card again. Um, and so in the meantime, your data is going, you know, into your uh, on-location hard drives, and then it might be going to your base camp hard drive, and it might be going to your server. Um, and then from your server to your offsite drives. But at any point in that system, if your drives break down, you can always take one step backwards and say, OK, so the server exploded. What was the last thing it was on before the server? It was on the location drive. Well, the location drive fell in quicksand. What happened? What was before that? Oh, well, we had the two uh, hard drives hooked up to the laptop and the computer case. OK, those got jacked by people with guns. What if maybe it's still on the CF card? And you go and you plug in the CF card, and there it is. And just by not dumping data until you need to, um, you can have just all of these layers of redundancy. Um, yeah, so go for it. We, we do have a luxury of having a lot of cards. 
Um, you also take a lot of pictures, and we can spin through all of our cards in the course of a day. I kid you not. <laughs> right. Um, we, and we have a stack of, and, and for those of your question, uh, we use the SanDisk Extreme Pro cards. Um, we actually were the first to get to use those. That was really fun over in New Zealand, down under. If you haven't checked that out, you can search Chase Jarvis uh, New Zealand or Chase Jarvis SanDisk. Um, and those cards have been super fast, super reliable. Um, I, we probably should have some of those out here as well. Um, and SanDisk supports us too. So um, we've got a good relationship with them and get to test stuff. Uh, but yeah, we, yeah. We, we create a lot of data. They have the 64 uh, gig cards. We tend to use what, what we tend to use more like the 32s. 32s. Yeah, 68. Yeah. Quite frankly, anytime you let him take 64 gigs of pictures before it goes anywhere else, <laughs> It just scares me. Um, so we try to keep it down a little bit reasonable. I don't know when 16 gigs became reasonable, but at some point in time it did. So that's where we try to stick around so that the stuff just gets off of the card and onto a computer um, sooner than it would be if it was a, a, on a 64. If it was on a 64, you could be shooting for five hours. And then when the camera gets jacked uh, at gunpoint or falls in quicksand, uh, or hosed. Um, or, or Nessie. Gets or it. Nessie gets it. Mm -hmm. or. Eric gets mad and just runs off the set with I a car. Like, ah! He does that all the time. Pirates. They got, got a high street value. Yeah. <laughs> um, quick follow up from a Jennifer here on, it might be Jennifer, but it's, there's no I. So call her, we'll go for Jennifer on the Twitter here. Uh, for folder management, what about multi day shoots? So this is just a quick follow up to uh, the whiteboard that was uh, in the whiteboard illustration there. Um, so if you can picture, you've got the year, and then you've got the name of the individual project, which for a single day shoot like today, I don't want to rewrite it all. For a single uh, day shoot like today, it would be today's date in reverse order, as in year, month, day, and then the name of the project. If this were a multi-day shoot, within that folder, there would be um, just more iterations of that same concept. So you'd have. The entire project would be named after the first day of shooting. Um, and then within that, you would have a folder for the first day of shooting, and then another folder for the second day of shooting, and another folder for the third day of shooting, et cetera. Um, so you just plug in a set of days into uh, the project level of the structure. Did that it, make any sense it, it at did, all? It did, it did. There's a lot of words like structure <laughs> and folder. But it, it I understood. Sweet. And, um, not the brightest bear in the bush. Um, Eric, you've been a good job, done a good job feeding us questions. Ian wants to know if there's extra storage in our beards. Uh, That's a good question. Yeah, I, I currently have a 32 gig beard. <laughs> uh, I'm looking to go for a 64 gig beard by the time winter really sets in. I like to keep a little extra storage in the beard. Uh, Scott you know, just upgraded his beard. Do you guys know that ZZ Top never had to carry around <laughs> any recording equipment because they were able to record all of their music servers. into their beards? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Their servers. And I, I'm a four gig beard. Yeah. And <laughs> as soon as I go through puberty, I'll. Eric's really. We're si we just sit working in, on We always beard. actually sit in order in, in from beard smallest order. beard to biggest beard. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's a flight. Anyway, it's like, hey, oh, hey, no, this is my friend Eric, and we just change places. Yeah. Uh, Jason wants to know how we archive our video projects when we're finished. Do we save everything? Yes, we save everything. Um, keeps everything future-proof. And we repurpose projects. The video remix that you just talked about for Benevolent Mischief would not have been possible if it weren't for the fact that we saved we save everything that's recorded on the cards. That, that makes it so we can go back and yeah, we reimagine had, things. We had Ross Sion on an early episode of Chase Jarvis Live performing uh, his new music. We had him in a conversation with myself, Charles Mudede, and, and Ross Sion, and then he performed live. We had that footage, and we didn't delete a single piece of it. And lo and behold, after doing the um, Benevolent Me Mischief original cut, Eric and I, as the story goes, were sitting there listening to the Victor Shade track. Mm -hmm. And it was like, wait a minute, that goes great with this. So we put it in there, and we went and grabbed old footage and put it together to make the video that I hope you will go watch and tell your friends about that Benevolent Mischief has been remixed. Yeah. And it was because we have all of those, um, that, that archived footage. Uh, one note about the, the, the theory there, the philosophy, and that is, it's my personal theory that data is, storing data is more affordable than going 
through every piece of data, making gut decisions really about what's worth keeping and what's not worth keeping. Yeah. Now, um, I've had the argument presented to me like, hey man, like, I don't got no money. This is really, I, it's, it's what I can do. I have to chuck all my crap so that I don't have to buy new hard drives. And I, I subscribed, I mean, we've all been there when we've had no money and need to <laughs> store yeah. data. So I'm sensitive to that argument. Um, but if you're using, if you have other equipment, cameras that's making a lot of data, I would use some of those resources and allocate some of it to a data storage plan that allows you to not throw away data. I mean, the larger drives that you buy, they tend to be scaled down in price, like, like what is it, megabytes like per two dollar. Two terabyte drives are sort of the sweet spot in the world right now. Yeah, and, and that allows you to keep to keep everything. Mm -hmm. And especially when you're creating as much volume as we do, like the, I, even just going through it all once is a heck of, a, uh, of a, a task. But if you had to make decisions about what was worthy and what wasn't at that time to throw a certain percentage of it away, first of all, you may be making those decisions under duress or with a completely different set of goggles on than if when we go back and, and at some point revisit, like, oh, do you remember that thing we shot? That'd be perfect for this. And if you check the one shot that was out of focus because it wasn't technically correct, at some point I've actually needed an out of focus shot of a runner on a beach you know, before. So it's hard to foresee into the future all of the ways you might use data. So again, it costs more, yes, but I'm an advocate of keeping everything and throwing away nothing. Um, storage is reasonably cheap given the tools that you are using to create that, yeah. generally speaking. We've debated media managing video projects because video takes up so much space, yeah. especially now with DSLRs where we take the small format that it shoots in and turn it into something that's way bigger. Like our file sizes are go times 10 when we convert them to what Final Cut Pro likes to play with. Which is ProRes. ProRes. And it um, just makes you too nervous to media manage stuff and let things go, let it die. So I, I'd say if you're on a smaller scale, if there's a project that was for a client that was years ago, I, I would I'd media manage. I wouldn't kill anything ever. But I mean, as, as far as like scalability, of just get the cheapest drives you can get, expensive drives are expensive because they're fast, they do all these things. Just get the slow USB 2 drives, get two of them, keep duplicates of everything. So if your cat knocks it off the kitchen table, right. you just go right back to the other one. Right, and again, it's, it's like, um, look at it as a car. Like, uh, less expensive car is still gonna get you from A to B. Um, and even within the brands that, that we use, like you know, G-Tech, uh, Hitachi, they have uh, lower end brands as well. They're all great compared to maybe something that would be out of a small paper catalog that you get in the mail. Um, but within certain brands, there are a, a range of price points too. So as Eric said, you can, if your data is less important to you, you can put it at risk by buying cheaper, cheaper stuff. So um, again, the overall picture is that we find it the right move to never throw away any data. We prefer to invest in storage mechanisms um, to keep it around because you never know what you're gonna do with it. Got a, got a good question, I think, in terms of also talking uh, on a level that's a little bit more scaled down. Um, <clears throat> from, let's see, Desin Z N Y or whoa. <laughs> Desin Zinc, uh, for guys like me who have a single MacBook Pro, how should workflow be on-site and off-site? Um, the single most important principle uh, that is discussed in this entire thing is always have duplicate versions of your data. Um, so having a single MacBook Pro, while a <coughs> fantastic place to start, is one half of where you need to be at bare minimum. It's got to be a single MacBook Pro and an additional hard drive. And it's fine to store data on the hard drive of your computer uh, if that's something that you need to do uh, for budgetary constraints or what have you. Um, but as, you know, as Chase was saying earlier, he's broken more laptop hard drives than any other hard drive by probably a factor of five, um, you know, because laptops are subject to so much more abuse and so much more use than your, your external hard drive would be. Um, so do not count on just your laptop hard drive supporting 
uh, your data. It's got to be that and another hard drive and always have that system in place. Right, and preferably that drive or that computer and two separate drives, ideally. Ken Mott uh, from Twitter <coughs> would like to know why no tape storage for long-term backup? Uh, and Ken, that's a really good point. Uh, we looked into tape and DTE um, and continue to do so. Uh, at the moment, we have a bunch of stuff invested in hard drive. It's already all there, terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of it. Um, so that's what we're sticking with. Uh, I don't see any problem with tape. I like tape, personally, um, uh, as far as convenience and moving it around back and forth. But to start up a whole new tape system when we've already got so much time invested in our hard drive system um, just hasn't been uh, necessary for us. Yeah, and, and we really see things evolving toward the cloud. I mean, yeah. you know, that's in the same way when you choose a manufacturer, a camera manufacturer, you start buying a lot of glass, you kind of are down that path. And we try and remain reasonably neutral to the direction of the path. Um, af but after we've chosen a manufacturer, we're taking a, a long-term look at the horizon and what the technology is going to be in one, three, five years. And we don't see a lot of people say, you know what, we're taking our stuff off the cloud and we're putting it on tape. Um, yeah. The hard drive is, the hard drive program that we use is, I think, reasonably priced. Um, it's one that works very well for us. And, and the future is going to be a combination of hard drive and cloud. So um, we're sticking to it. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's our story, and we're sticking to it. The cloud comment goes towards the previous guy with a MacBook, too. I, I, while everything's on your MacBook, and if you just can't afford a hard drive, which um, is certainly possible out there. Uh, you could spend five bucks a month on one of those uh, services and just back up your photos to that too. Um, there's there's incremental dollar amounts you can spend to get better and better access and protection of your your photos. Um, the downside with the cloud is uh, if you lose a whole wedding or a whole photo shoot or anything like that, you've got to pull it all back down from the cloud. Well, that's going to take some time, and you're going to be behind um, the eight ball on whatever it is that you're trying to do without having the faster access to that data. But if all you've got is five bucks this month, go and invest in like uh, 10 gigs of cloud storage. Mm -hmm. It's a good one. And I, I, I should just, it's, it's going that way. You know yeah. what I mean? So, so to be able to be a part of the future and to have one leg in both, and the manufacturers know that. I mean, again, we work closely with GTEC and they're smart people over there. And uh, I think we, we know that we're gonna have one world in reality here on Earth and one we're one foot in reality here on Earth and one foot in the clouds. Our heads will be in the clouds. <laughs> that too, being but, said, yeah. everything that's stored in the cloud is stored on a hard drive somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Or a bunch of hard drives somewhere. Right. Um, you know, there's vast data centers filled with hard drives. So uh, we might be moving it off of our hard drives and onto someone else's hard drives, but it's still staying on hard drives for now until we have that optical storage cube thing that we were promised. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Brings back to ground zero. I'm Chase Jarvis. This is D'Artagnan, Scott, and Eric. And we are talking about workflow for photo and video um, and anything, really, audio, music. Uh, we have a similar view on all of those things. And we're trying to help share what it is that we've learned over the past 10 or 15 years working in the professional space about how to treat data, how to make sure it's backed up safely, and, uh, and, and pass that, that information on to you. Um, it sounds, it's, it's, it's kind of geeky stuff. I mean, I tend not to be a little gadget guy. I'm <laughs> it's the guy with the big beard. I'm a gadget the, guy. That's the guy with the big beard and the glasses. <laughs> Go figure. Um, Shorts and sandals. But yeah. it's just so mission critical to the survival of data. And our job, my job as an artist, is to have those things around and available. So it's just an important reality. Um, Eric, tell me a story. Mike wants to know how do we organize resources for things like composites and video editing of shots are from different days shoots projects so things that are new that is you get home and you sure start working on something you you know, you know we make duplicates of files when we turn stuff to prores you create graphics and new content we have two sections on our server one is the big storage where everything that's shot goes. Raw data. Raw data. And then another section where it's sort of your working projects. And so you go in there and everything is sort of 
has a more specific organization there if it's for clients or personal work. And so when I'm working on a video project, that's where I go to create like my Final Cut Pro project. I give myself a little folder where I drop in everything that might be new. When I bring in music, I want to keep it all on the server, so I stack it all up in there. And there's a similar workflow that you guys do for photos, correct? Yeah, the, 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 before Scott talks about photos, the, the theory is a, is a simple one, and Eric started touching on it, which is we have an area of the server which is absolutely sacred. It is the raw data that is left in the operating system in folders that are organized as Scott showed you earlier on the whiteboard and that you can see in the video. That is sacred. Nothing gets touched in there. It's you only, once you put it there, it lives there and gets backed up like that. Anytime you go take something and start futzing with the pixels, it gets saved somewhere else. No pixel futzing in the sacred data zone. We happen to call that live work. Even if it's a couple months old, it's still live because we were massaging those pixels. So whether Eric's doing a Final Cut Pro project, um, shooting, you know, the, uh, editing a television commercial, or whether we're massaging pixels for a still photo ad campaign, they live in separate sections in what we call live work, and they are backed up on a slightly different paradigm than all that stuff is here in the studio. Um, and they are backed up on a slightly different paradigm than what we've articulated already. Uh, and I'll let Scott address that. Cool. Um, this is the trickiest part of the whole workflow video, I think. Mm -hmm. This is. I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think even with a whiteboard, I'm, this is going to be yeah. completely nonsensical. But just try and keep it the, theoretical and keep yeah, it high level. The, the, the theory is that, uh, so, the raw data when it came in, it got onto the server and then it got onto an offsite drive. And that's a one step process. Once it's on that offsite drive, it's, ah, that's done. The raw data is never going to get touched. The offsite drive is offsite and safe. So that's kind of a closed loop. Um, the live work, however, which is the second segment of the server, is constantly changing. Um, so a single time backup doesn't protect that. We, all, we have to have a constantly refreshing backup. So uh, what we have is these two terabyte uh, G drives here. Um, that's right, right? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right, currently. And we have one of those things plugged into the server uh, at all times. Uh, and Apple's Time Machine, which is the, the backup program built into, within the Apple operating system, uh, is being told to write any changes that have happened in live work um, to that drive. And that's always happening every hour, all day, every day. Um, once a week, we take that drive and we exchange it with one that's been off-site for a week. Uh, and so then this one here, which has everything that happened until Friday afternoon on it, gets pulled off and a new one gets inserted. And that one starts writing. Um, and so we constantly have a second, or a second copy of the live work going. Uh, and if that second copy were to ever break down while it's in the studio. And can I, I, need, to, I need to make one point. Like, yep. This is actually a backup of what's happening. So the live work is on a server. We have a backup copy, which is the two terabyte G drive right here. And then we have an, an offsite version of that. So if the server for some reason blew up, which it's not because it's spread over 16 or 32 <laughs> drives. Then we have this live work backed up, all the recent the projects that Eric's working on, the, all the pixels, all the photos that, that Scott's been retouching and managing. And then we've got another copy offsite. Now, if in the course of that week, that's where you were going, right? It is indeed. So if in the course of the week, the drive that's, that is uh, currently hooked up to the server and running the time machine, if that were to have any problems, um, and the server were to, have a problem, were to have a problem, we could always go back to this drive, which has been backing up all of the live work. And at worst, it's going back to whatever the previous Friday afternoon status was. Um, and so generally speaking, worst case scenario, and that is a terrible scenario where both of the drives in the office, both the server and the server's backup drive, implode. Never going to happen. <laughs> We still have a redundant copy offsite off that can never be any more than seven days uh, from brand new. Um, yeah, there we uh, go. In addition to that, we actually, uh, the way most of us, well, the three of us work off the server, 
is that oftentimes wait, we'll wait, pull wait, stuff wait, wait, local to it. our. I mean, him too, mostly. <laughs> uh, the way that most of us work uh, is we'll pull stuff down off the server onto our local Mac Pros at our desk, and those also are running Time Machine. Um, so, in order for us to really lose data, you'd, uh, there'd have to be a nuclear explosion in here. Um, anything short of that, you're not really going to take Some it all out. Some sort of pulse, an electromagnetic pulse. Yeah, but it's got to be one of those that erases hard drives, too. Yeah. 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 I think we're all right. They make movies about that stuff. It's true. So if John Travolta comes with an EMP into the studio, gets past the lasers, the dogs, the machine guns, the auto turrets, <laughs> sets off his EMP and destroys all our data, we're still good. We're still six and a half days behind. Right. Andy we're all, yeah. Yeah. Andy really made me mad. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm coming for you. Was it Sy Stallone that you were just talking about? No. Uh, Travolta. <laughs> Travolta. That's a pretty good yeah. Travolta. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Same, yeah, it was, same, it was same, same thing. I love what you did in Pulp Fiction, John. Um, yeah, so there's, again, that's the live work version of what it is that uh, we're talking about there, backing that up. Um, let's take this down to non, like, photo studio pro level, down to uh, individual photographer. <clears throat> you should be having, you should have a hard drive that's running backup on your primary computer time machine. Backing up every hour, and then every day, and every week back until a hard drive is full. We actually use that system on every one of our individual machines as well. My laptop backs up to a separate drive. Um, all these guys' workstations back up to a separate drive so that we're protected on the local, lo local machine level. That also backs up all your email preferences, all your email, your preferences, um, anything that might be local. If you are that independent photographer, videographer, you've got that going on, backing up anything that's on your computer, and then you should also have what I believe to be, at base minimum, two drives, one main, one backup, and then something offsite. So it's totally scalable. We're talking about these crazy rotating systems, but it doesn't have to be like that. It can be all your pictures here, all your pictures here, all your pictures at mom's house, and time machine backing up this guy here. Um, Taking a question here, uh, does the Apple light still show up through your Banksy MacBook cover? <laughs> there yes. It does, yeah. It's kind of bright in here because we've got a light on us. But yeah, it does. It's kind of nice. It's right there by her head. <laughs> uh, Mike <laughs> wants to know if, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's not Mike. It's William wants to know if there is a, we keep talking about time machine and everything else. Uh, is there a PC equivalent? Um, none of us, uh, yeah, no, none of us are, are PC users, uh, per se. I, I know that there are services. Uh, what comes to mind is Mosey, I think, has some <coughs> software uh, that is the same thing, that'll do hourly incremental backups. Uh, what you're looking for, basically, is any software that will do a backup every hour and then also every day, and just sort of keep those around until it runs out of whatever given space you say. So if you say, all right, on my two terabyte hard drive, I want to give uh, a terabyte of that to this backup process, so it'll just keep writing everything until it fills that, and then it deletes the oldest stuff as it adds new stuff. So it always keeps you protected for some length of time. What else you got there, Scotty? Let's see. How about, uh, let's see, I kind of lost in the Twitter stream uh, one that I was looking at a little bit ago, um, but it was asking about uh, the workflow and codecs and what have you for uh, DSLR video. Um, so maybe Eric can quickly address uh, the workflow and the software and the formats. Yeah. So for video, the stuff that comes out of the camera is H.264 in, in most cases. Um, some of the Nikon cameras shoot AVIs or, or it looks like they're all going H.264 with the D7000. Yeah. Um, Final Cut Pro doesn't really like that format. It creates all sorts of problems with rendering and even just simple playback. It likes to hang on clips sometimes and it, 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 uh, it'll drive you insane. So we take everything through a compressor, which is part of the Final Cut Studio. We convert everything to ProRes. There are different levels of, of ProRes. Someone asked if ProRes 444 is overkill. Um, you know, like for things like color grading, it'll hold more information. I don't, I've never compared like file sizes versus how long it takes. I, I've never noticed a difference in quality. So I, I guess maybe 444 is overkill. But so we run everything through compressor, and on a big shoot, that takes a very long time. But DSLRs are so great that I 
just say it's worth it. Um, so we'll get back from a shoot, set it and forget it, let it run overnight, have D'Artagnan log in from home because he has the technology to check in and make sure it's still going. And um, from there, you just bring it in and start working with it. Uh, sometimes with some cameras, uh, like if some of these DSLRs can shoot 60p, um, you can bring it into Cinema Tools, which is another part of the Final Cut Studio, and you can conform it to 24 frames a second, which makes it slow motion. You can do the same thing with 30p stuff. It'll give it like a hint of slow motion, which is kind of cool. Like the D7000 can shoot 30p. And some of the older Nikon cameras, looks like they've, they've learned, is um, they shot like a, tr a true 24p, mm. which doesn't sync up with audio very nicely. Mm. Um, audio, is, every, everything is like 2398, 2997 is sort of the, the NTSC, is sort of the standard of frame rates, um, which I can't elaborate on because it's, it's beyond crazy. my, my nerd dumb. But um, compressor, or, uh, Cinema Tools will clean that stuff up. You can take something that's 24 and change it to 2397 to make sure it syncs up with all your audio that your sound guys recorded separately. Um, backing up to compressor, if you're not in the final cut workflow, uh, MPEG Stream Clip is a very cheap, um, possibly free uh, piece of software that does the same thing. You do batch conversions, and it, it's really great. It brings in everything and outputs everything. Um, that's about it. We, so we use, yeah, compressor, Final Cut Pro, ProRes. Boom. Mm -hmm. And there are some other, we, we do a lot of work with the RED cameras. Um, we like you, RED. You're very nice to us and uh, you make pretty files. We use the Red Cine software. Uh, it's basically because it shoots in a raw format with a lot of latitude. So we use the Red Cine software, which is not like our favorite thing in the world. <laughs> but uh, it's, we, we take files through that process, make them look nice and pretty, output, um, output there. And um, same with the Phantom, the Phantom camera, the Phantom HD which is, shoots at 1,000 frames per second um, in full 1080. That has its own workflow, too. But So by and large, we end up kicking everything into 422, and that's what we uniformly drive our Final Cut Pro um, projects through. Final yep. Cut Pro's Apple, Apple yep. platform. There's also others that we Plenty of others. Use. Yep. Avid and what's the? Adobe Premiere. Right. There you go. Uh, Sony Vegas is pretty cool. Vegas. Sony Vegas. Oh, Vegas. Vegas, baby. Mm. Mm. So, uh, um, but again, we use Apple Final Cut Pro, and it's, I think m most folks, I don't want to make an assumption, but I think if you look at the market share, it's pretty heavily tilted toward Final, Final Cut Studio is rad. comes with everything you need. Yep. So you're set. And, and then, then all the red conversion stuff, red gives away that software for free. Right. And it, you have and, to have it. <coughs> and it does uh, the Final Cut Pro stu uh, Studio. It also, in the same way that we like Aperture, it integrates really nicely with the Apple ecosystem. It all, you know, you can send things back and forth to one another, and uh, and and we, of course, like that option um, as well. So my computer just ran out of batteries because I didn't plug it in for the last two days. <laughs> you want the road wire? No, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so Tim uh, Roper says, and this is a point that. We sort of glanced on, but didn't fully touch. Uh, what happens to the live work once it gets to a uh, archived state? Um, and that's something that we do actually have a plan for, um, Tim. I got one so, back here, man. I don't know, Scott, if you want to continue elaborating down Please. your... All right. Um, so we, we have our live drives that are getting time machined, obviously. But uh, if we just let that keep expanding and expanding and expanding, uh, two things happen. One, the two terabyte drives will eventually run out of space, so will four, so will eight, so will 16 at some point in time. And the time that it takes to back up all that stuff will become longer than we have in our week-long rotation. Um, so what we did was we segment our live drive to a archive portion and a current portion, and we set our time limit on how long stuff stays in current. So once a quarter, maybe for yourself it's going to be once every six months or once a year, who knows, uh, just depending on how much data you're creating. Um, you take everything that hasn't <coughs> been touched in three months and stick it in the archive section. Every folder that's in 
one is in the other. So every client, every Word document, every whatever, uh, every upper level folder structure is copied over on both sides. So you can move it from uh, our client work over on the current side to our client work on the archive side. And that gets backed up once a quarter. So stuff is moving out of current and into archive and getting backed up less frequently. Uh, it still gets backed up more regularly than the one time this is our raw data, we put it away, because there is potential for us to go back and change something to it. Um, somebody might make a, an image request, a stock request for something we shot a year and a half ago. Scott will go in and uh, maybe tweak up some contrast or something like that. And we want to make sure that gets picked up, um, but it's not receiving the same amount of attention that it was while it was in the current work. So it's not going to be backed up every hour. That's what we do with our stuff that reaches archive status. Tim Four. Snap. Um, we're having good fun here talking about photo and video workflow. We are data nerds um, and we're hoping to share a little bit of knowledge and, uh, and maybe learn something too. We're at the phones constantly, which is Twitter, hashtag CJ Live. Um, if you want to uh, pay attention to what it is that I'm doing on Twitter, it's twitter.com slash Chase Jarvis or the old at Chase Jarvis. We're taking a peek at all of those and their questions are coming in pretty hot and heavy. Um, and Eric's about to dive into another one right now. I like this question just came in. Do you line item data storage on your invoices? Do you charge clients to store it? We tend to have a media archive fee. That fee is flexible depending on how much data storage we will be capturing. Um, but since we go through a lot of hard drives, um, we, we build a client for those hard drives. And often they keep them. <laughs> whether we like to do it or not, or it's a big ad agency and it just gets tracked down. But um, there are costs, even with the cables and all that stuff that we're, we're constantly buying. Um, I've mentioned before, we're supported by several manufacturers, but um, there are a lot of costs that go into maintaining that. And so we usually have a flat fee, of, and it's cheap, it's like 150 bucks um, for commercial projects, um, media management. Um, or data archive storage. I don't remember what the line item is called. So, yeah, and and people seem they understand because they all are backing up their own music now, and that's one of the things that I love about this particular CJ Live, um, in, in this particular CJ Live in particular, um, <laughs> is is that this like we're talking about pro photo and video storage, but it's my hope out there that. There are people watching who aren't pro photographers and filmmakers, and that they just want to know how to back up their music. And all of these things apply in some way, shape, or form, um, primarily the theory. And the theory, again, we've said it three or four times throughout the course of the broadcast, is as soon as you can, have multiple copies of your data, have them separate but equal, and have another one off-site in case something happens a fire or a flood or the Loch Ness Monster, uh, Nessie, attacks your home. For all those reasons, this should be able to apply to anybody on the internet who's using a computer. So, Len Hicks actually asked, uh, you are going to go there too, weren't exactly you? We were where both going to go. The same tweet. Um, wants to know if we use a similar or scaled down backup plan in our home lives. Um, so I know that... Uh, you just sort of touched on that we sort of scale it everywhere, but I thought it might be fun to say what we do for our home lives. Sure. Sweet. E-Rock, small beard, start it off. <laughs> Arr, um, small beard. Arr. I keep, yeah, I have my laptop at home, and then I have uh, an external hard drive that's hooked up to a Mac Mini that's sort of part of my entertainment center. And as rarely as I can, I don't have any automated system of doing it. I use Time Machine. I have a little drive that I try to plug in every couple days and keep everything backed up on there. <coughs> but then I keep um, copies of all my music and all my photos on two separate drives. And then for personal video work, um, I have, I'll have a drive, like a, a more portable drive, like what we use for our, on our field drives that I work off of. Um, just because of my laptop. Actually, my laptop drive is big enough now to work off of because our chaining hooked me up with a bigger drive. <laughs> but uh, I, I would work off of a, of a portable drive, and then would, and that's sort of my live work at home. And then stuff that's, when it's done, it goes on to like a cheap USB 2 Western digital drive. And I keep two of those, Archive 1 and Archive 2, and they just live in my closet. I'm not as worried about off-site storage and, and 
most of those projects are things that I that wouldn't be a disaster to lose. So uh, it's less mission critical. But uh, the stuff that really matters to me, like the, the photos and music, is on, on two drives and the time machine drive. Yeah, and since I am a photographer uh, and a video person by trade and by profession, basically any picture that I take um, on my iPhone, you guys know I'm a huge iPhone photography freak. Um, got the best camera, the book, the best cameras, one that's with you, all that stuff. Basically, all of these things flow through here at work for us since any, any photo I take or any video clip can likely turn into something um, bigger out in the internet world. Um, with regard to movies and music, um, I have a, a server at home and the server um, has a backup, a time machine backup just like everything here. Um, it's backing up music, movies, all that stuff. And I also make use of Apple TV and, uh, and all that good stuff as well. And this happens to live in a little server case. Um, but same protocols as we use here. D'Artagnan, what, what, what's up? Oh, you're just raising five minutes. Five minutes. All right. Five minutes, I got, uh, it's 10.47. It was actually 8 40, 84 minutes from when we started. Yeah, you started your clock late. Yeah. You started your clock minutes. like oh, six minutes. Oh, that's man. how we determine the format for this. The <laughs> right. format for this show, it's not 90 <laughs> minutes, it's 84 minutes. And if you want to know why, it's because that's how long a P2 card lasts <laughs> in that camera that he's using right there. Two 16 gig cards. Two 16 gig cards. minutes. We can go longer because we're actually recording uh, externally, but we're not recording the sound Chase externally. We can't ah. tell Chase we can go longer. Yeah, no, why are you <laughs> I mean, we can. I, no, but I did say we will lose our raw data that we're recording. Ooh, so, see? so bad. Less, less than, uh, like, right. Practice what you preach. Cards are going to run out, yeah. and sound will not be getting recorded because we are only recording the visuals that are coming out. Okay. Through the, the, ca the camera there. So we're going to start to wind down. Um, we wouldn't want to have bad data practice. We'll do Scott's <laughs> home yeah. process do, real fast. Do Scott's or? home process. That'd be a good thing to do. All right. Maybe just because it's simple, this sounds. This would be nice. Uh, I have a laptop that I hook up to a hard drive, not unlike this one here. Um, and then I have uh, what's called a time capsule, which is an Apple product that is a, uh, a hard drive with a wireless <coughs> router built in. Um, so it serves both as your, as your router and as your um, backup drive, and it can do that wirelessly. Uh, so it's super brainless for me anytime I've got that hard drive hooked up, my external hard drive hooked up to my laptop, my time machine sniffs it, and it tries to back it up. Uh, and generally successfully. Um, so, super simple system that works really well. Right, and that's, that was a great idea to kind of show the scaled down version of what the pros do at home. Um, as we start running it down, because we're now in four minutes left in this broadcast, um, we are going to make this available online via YouTube um, to check back and to refresh. Um, we have, I think, demonstrated, I know there's no way we were able to keep up with all the questions. Um, apologize, but feel free to ask those questions on on the blog or continue via Twitter. Um, go back and refresh that post. If you go back to yesterday's post that's, that announced what we were doing today, there are a bunch of questions in there. We can, we will use that as a forum, so to speak, of for any questions that didn't get answered. And I know there's hundreds, not maybe not thousands, but certainly hundreds. Um, and again, I could talk about this all day because I love it. I know these guys um, are right there with me, but uh, alas, all good things must come to an end. Um, let's each answer one other question as fast as we can, and then I'm going to sign out. So mine is, uh, what software do you use to back up your iPhone photos? Um, I don't back it up. D'Artagnan does for me. So <laughs> back it up. D'Artagnan, of course, we sync it with uh, we sync it with um, iTunes, and iTunes gets backed up as a part of my backing up my uh, my laptop here. Doesn't actually pull your photos off your iPhone. Um, we use uh, iTunes or the iPhones have to be backed up and downloaded on whatever computer they're associated with. So we use uh, image capture on Chase's laptop to pull all the photos off of the image capture. Just comes in your utilities folder on your Mac. Um, all the photos off his iPhone, and then we put them on the server, and they run through the regular workflow. Sweet, Scotty. Sweet. Quick question. Uh, dun, 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 dun. 
Uh, I'm going to answer my quick question. Nice. Uh, <laughs> wait, I'm going to. Oh, here we go. Photo Man Steve uh, wants to know if we all have secret identities that we use in real life like superheroes. Ironically, my secret identity is Photo Man Steve. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no secret identity for me. Uh, you can uh, pretty much find me anywhere on the planet as D'Artagnan at almost any right. sharing <laughs> social media service you can think of. Mm -hmm. Right. Eric, quick question for you. Uh, do you guys color grade in Final Cut Studio Color or use Magic Bullet, Bullet Looks or Colorista, et cetera? Most of the color correction I do, I do rudimentally in Final Cut Pro. I like it. It works well for me. We've used color. Um, I've used Magic Bullet Look before. Uh, color is a little beefy. It's definitely super pro. We, we do. Magic, you, I mean, we, we, we've, we've done a fair bit through color, export it over to the color world yeah. and send it back. And that's kind of like the, oh, we're taking this one into color. It's yeah. like we're going into battle. Deal. We, not, we only usually do it for behind the scenes stuff, right. but uh, big important client stuff we do. Um, as for Magic Bullet looks, I've used it. It's very cool. I like it. Sweet. Cool. Um, uh, there's a question really quickly. How do you guys manage your Lightroom presets? I get uh, frustrated with the hundred or so I have. Um, so we generally use Aperture as opposed to Lightroom. It too has the capacity to make presets. Um, but we really only tend to use presets within the scope of a single project um, where all of the, you know, all the lighting conditions were similar, uh, the aesthetic we're going for is similar. Um, but on the whole, we try and avoid uh, exposing our entire, uh, I don't know, catalog Shoot. of work to any given aesthetic right. um, because we find it really limiting. So. Uh, not huge preset users. Yeah, we're not, not huge preset users. Uh, I'm going to wind us down here, folks. Thank you very much for tuning into this uh, episode of Chase Jarvis Live. Leave you with a reminder that there's a new remixed version of my first film with uh, the Nikon D7000 called Benevolent Mischief. It's now a music video. Check it out, share it with your friends. Uh, I know I owe you a Seattle 100 um, update as we're moving closer to launch doing a lot, of, a lot of fun stuff with the publisher, making videos and whatnot. I'll give you one of those this week via a vlog. Um, and lastly, I am going to China on Friday, and I'll be sailing from uh, in, in a 110-foot boat, I believe, um, with Mike Horn, the world-renowned explorer. For, it's it's going to be great for um, the luxury watch band Panerai. And uh, I will be updating as I can. We'll be shooting uh, the D7000, the D3S, making stills and video. Um, it's going to be a hoot. So please do follow along. I'm going to try and be broadcasting every day. I'll be taking questions. That, I think, wraps One up. One last thing. Yep. Yes, you can watch this video on YouTube, but you can also watch it, if you like, on our podcast. Or yeah, if you like the podcast. Eric. Let's talk about the podcast. Is yeah. it? Okay. I was going to say. Or okay. if you like Eric and you like audio podcasts. We have an audio podcast as well that yes. is just the words and none of the pictures if you listen while you drive. Yeah, and that will be, I will make an announcement of that because that's been running quietly in the background as we're testing it and I haven't told anybody yet. Signing off, au revoir from Chase Jarvis Live. We bid you adieu. Ciao.